Hi, Eric Marcus here. If you listened to our recent Making Gay History episode featuring Ann Northrup, you already know that ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, was a driving force in bringing attention to the AIDS crisis and calling to account the government, the pharmaceutical industry, and religious institutions. The group's actions and tactics, history and legacy, are still talked about, studied, and tapped as inspiration. So as a bonus, I wanted to share a recent interview with another prominent ACT UP New York member, Peter Staley. The interview was conducted last year by my friend Jeffrey Masters, host of the LGBTQ&A podcast, which is produced by The Advocate magazine in partnership with GLAAD. It's a terrific and sometimes surprising interview, and just one of the more than 200 LGBTQ&A episodes that are currently available. Listen to them wherever you get your podcasts, or visit lgbtqpodcast.com. Peter Staley was working on Wall Street when one day he was handed a flyer about a, quote, massive AIDS demonstration taking place in front of the Trinity Church, just a block away. The flyer listed demands targeting the government, the Food and Drug Administration, President Reagan. This was March 24th, 1987, the very first demonstration that ACT UP carried out. Now, Peter knew that he was living with HIV at this point, knew that something big needed to be done. So he went to the very next meeting, joined the group, and by that next March, a year later, he'd quit his job in order to devote every hour that he had to ACT UP. And you knew that we were going to change the world. We didn't know in what way. We didn't know if we'd succeed. But we knew we were going to be out there making a difference for the next few years. Now, we often hear stories about the pain and trauma of these years, and it was a harrowing time, so that makes sense. But one of those things that I appreciate about Peter Staley in his memoir, Never Silent, is that Peter doesn't shy away from also talking about the joy that existed during this time. They went out, they partied, they created community, they had sex. He describes ACT UP as the most sex-positive movement in American history, and this was a crucial component to their work. There is no way we could have gotten through the tragedy that was those years, the emotional damage that we were accruing, the PTSD that we eventually all suffered. There's no way we would have gotten through that without a heavy dose of sex, love, humor, community. It was a surreal existence. So today we talk about all of that, about how much has changed for those living with HIV, and what is still left to be done. Because as we know, HIV is not something that only existed in the past. An estimated 700,000 people have died in the US, and worldwide that number is more than 32 million. So from The Advocate Magazine, in partnership with GLAAD, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ&A with Peter Staley, the now legendary member of ACT UP, and the author of the new memoir, Never Silent. So going back a bit, you know, you learned that you were living with HIV in 1985. But before that, living in New York City and starting to hear about it more and seeing people sick, at what point did it become impossible to ignore? It really, it really was the same year I found out. 1985, it became impossible to ignore. That's, that's when almost all gay men in New York knew someone who was sick or had died. Certainly, the younger gays like myself knew fewer because it really did hit the 30-somethings first. HIV has a very long incubation period. So the very first cases in 1981, those people were infected in the late 70s. By the time 83 came around, 83, 84, upwards of 50% of gay men in New York were HIV positive and didn't know it. So it was silently transmitting and the sick and the dying had been HIV positive for many years. And so you joined ACT UP in 87, just as the group was getting started. Do you think you would have joined so early had you not known your own status? Probably not. I've always been very upfront that I came to the movement for very selfish reasons. I was desperate. I was afraid I only had a few years to live. 
I was trying to learn everything I could as quickly as possible to see if I could buy myself some time. And that included learning about the gay community in New York, which, you know, as a closet case, I only knew the bars. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know who Larry Kramer was. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I was on a steep learning curve, and, and here this movement was born just in time. And within months of attending those meetings, though, I was shedding that selfishness and getting caught up in this community response that we were doing something that would impact far more people than those in the room. I mean, I'm a skeptical person. I think if I joined a group like this, my assumption would be that we're going to have meetings and talk and that's all we're going to do. We're never going to have like meaningful action. Was it obvious from the beginning how effective they were and would be? Yeah. I mean, the, the first action, I hadn't even joined the group. I got handed a flyer on my way to work on Wall Street. Their first action was on Wall Street and it was on the nightly news. We forget, you know, we live in a very gay gay world now that's integrated with the straight world. But back then, gays were hidden and not talked about, and we weren't on the news, we weren't on television. So the very fact that we took to the streets en masse and laid down our bodies and, and said, take us away, get it, arrest us, that was a major news story. America had never seen us do that consistently, week after week, month after month. So we pretty quickly, from the get-go, became the movement du jour in America. We were the Occupy, the Black Lives Matter of our time. And it happened very quickly. I mean, that must have been in intoxicating to be a part of. Totally. From my very first meeting, I, I got there right after that first demo. There were already over 100 people in the room. And the energy was just palpable. There were old timers in the room. There, there were some veterans of Stonewall there. There was a hardcore group of lesbians who had lots of movement experience with reproductive rights and, and anti-war and post-Stonewall radical activism that had died out in the early 70s. And you could see in their eyes that they hadn't seen anything like this since Stonewall. <laughs> and that they knew it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a popped balloon that everybody was worried might fizzle out in a week. It was a broken dam and, and the water was gushing. And you knew that we were going to change the world. We didn't know in what way. We didn't know if we'd succeed, but we knew we were going to be out there making a difference for the next few years. I mean, in hindsight, you were Correct. So I guess I'm surprised to hear that in the moment you, you knew it, though, even back then. Yeah, yeah. No, it felt like history. And that's why within weeks, the young videographers, the artists in the room had their cameras out. You know, they were recording it. We didn't have cell phones back then, but they knew that history was being made. So even our earliest meetings were being filmed. And one of the things I think is so special about ACT UP, and I think is absent from a lot of modern activism, is humor. You know, ACT UP brought a levity and like a queer sensibility to so many of like the actions and zaps. Like for you, why do you think, or what was the purpose of humor? Well, first off, it was a kind of humor. It was very dark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's what I relate to. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think it's it's part of the, the queer experience, right? We're, we are the master artists. We are the Michelangelos of dark humor. And we would not have gotten through those years if it weren't for that. If, the, if we didn't decide from the get-go that we were going to burn the candle at both ends, do our activism full on, but at the same time, passionately live like we've never lived before. Because we, we really did feel like our backs were up against the wall. And there's no way we could have gotten through the tragedy that was those years, the, the constant memorials and the loss of friends and lovers and the hospital visits that were unrelenting, the emotional damage that we were accruing, the PTSD that we have eventually all suffered. There's no way we would have gotten through that without a heavy dose of sex, love, humor, community. It was a surreal existence. 
because things were so dire, you had you had to have fun. You had to find joy. And then sex function in that way, as you said. And the clubs were at their best in New York. Every weekend we would act up, would dominate the best gay dance floors in New York. And ecstasy was a new drug. So we were popping ecstasy right and left. It was pure. It was the best ecstasy. <laughs> Oh my God, I have great memories of those times. And people don't realize we were the most sex positive movement in American history, which is very strange given that people consider that Larry Kramer kind of founded the group by giving this speech that sparked our existence. He's not known for his sex positivity, but we were under this stigma from the rest of the country that was extraordinary where we were seeing in the New York Times op-ed piece suggesting that we be quarantined. There was certainly a national feeling that gay men should stop having sex altogether. And our in-your-face counter to that was, no, safe sex works. We know it works. And we're going to have lots of it to show you it works. So we became a very, very sex positive. And you know, we did these kiss-ins in straight bars. We would en masse enter some of the straightest bars in New York, get ourselves the tables, order our beers. Everybody didn't know what was going on. And then we'd all start making out right in front of them. <laughs> It's very funny. And it was, you know, and we were had strength in numbers so we wouldn't get the shit kicked out of us. It was an amazing time. So I guess also sex was this way to reclaim queerness so that being gay wasn't only in relation to HIV. It was this like positive thing as well. Yeah, it was very queer forward, very queer proud. And I, I think it was the most beautiful moment in, in queer history in, in many respects and something we can feel very proud of. And I think it really relaunched the modern gay rights movement. Everything that came after gays in the military, gay marriage, fully embracing the T and LGBT in recent years is all because of the proud, out, indignant form of activism that ACT UP created. I mean, there was so much misinformation in the beginning. When did you learn for certain that one of the ways that HIV was transmitted was through sex? Well, that was pretty obvious to smart epidemiologists from the get-go, pretty much 81, 82. Obvious why? Well, it was happening almost primarily in gay men. It was not happening between gay men and others nearby. It was not happening in casual settings. Obviously, if it happened through touch or surface transmission, then every gay waiter in New York would have quickly infected all of New York City. So that was ruled out by the epidemiologists. And that left intimate contact. And obviously, we were doing plenty of that. And once they isolated the virus in 83, 84, they announced it in 84, then we had the pathogen and we quickly were able to see exactly how it was transmitted, which was through bodily fluids, primarily blood and semen. And so 1985, you are told you have HIV, you're living with HIV. Did, did you assume at that point that you would never have sex again? I mean, that's, your, that's one of your first thoughts. Um, yeah. But, you know, you begin worrying about that a few months later. I mean, the first thing you're thinking about is, you know, I'm not going to be on this earth for much longer. There were no treatments in 85. And it was considered 100% fatal. So it was a scary time. And then, you know, I went to a support group the following year that GMHC was running. And I was hearing from most of the guys in the room that they had stopped having sex altogether. They thought that they were tainted meat. And I was already boning up on the science and knew that the CDC had come out and said condoms work. So I was ready to get back into the game. And that oral sex was, was very safe. There was one guy across the room from me who started, started saying, well, I'm not going to stop having sex. And he shot back to the rest of the room, you know, that safe sex works and I'm going to have plenty of it. And I was like, that's the guy I want to talk to. <laughs> it turned out to be Griffin Gold, who was one of the founders of the People with AIDS Coalition. In the book, you call it the condom code. Is that how it was described back then? Or is that just like how you would describe it now like in the book? Yeah, that came later, I think, by the early or middle 90s. It had been 
such a social norm that got established to the point where there was some shaming that would occur among gay men if somebody tried to say, oh, you know, let's not use a condom. But condom fatigue started setting in. People forget this, but it started setting in in the early 90s. This is, this is before the death rate peaked. We started wearing condoms pretty universally in the late 80s. The rate of HIV transmission plummeted within two years between 85 and 87, really crashed. But even then, there were like 30,000 gay men becoming infected every year. It wasn't universal. This is sex we're talking about. I know very few people that lead perfect sex lives, and, and we're all human, and there, there are lapses. And there were a portion who weren't using them consistently. You know, ACT UP was fighting for specific policy goals, but it also changed the world. It changed the world in how people thought about and saw gay people, which was not the original goal, but a lovely side effect. Exactly. So was that obvious from the beginning? Like, when did you start to realize that? I mean, we knew that homophobia was one of our major obstacles to creating change. And Gallup had a poll that it started in the late 70s that measured America's homophobia. And it was obvious that the AIDS crisis was making it worse. And if we didn't turn that around, we would be unlikely to convince any politician to do the right thing for us. So that homophobia was on our agenda. And we took a risky bet that the best way to turn that around, since it was only getting worse as we were quiet about things, that the way to turn that around was to just be totally in your face, show our anger, show our determination, put our bodies in the street. And the FDA demo in our second year where we shut down the whole agency for a day with hundreds of demonstrators from all the ACT UP chapters around the country, lead story on all the networks. That was kind of our national coming out, and the country had just never seen anything like it. I think that began to shatter the American myth of the homosexual, which was weak and timid. The media played a huge role because they showed us in the streets month after month after month, and what America saw was a community that was organized, determined, angry, and knowledgeable. And they wrapped it up with the dual storyline of how in the absence of government support, we had started setting up all these organizations to take care of our own. That beautiful self-help movement of GMHC and San Francisco AIDS Foundation and the People with AIDS Coalition and the Buyers Clubs. We created this whole network and the buddy system so that no person with HIV would die alone. And the press started running those stories. And this just, this all got wrapped together and it guilt tripped every American out there. Even the ones who hated us, they were like, shit, this is gross what America's doing here to these people. That's so interesting. So for the first time, people are seeing queer people in the news. They're showing a portrait of strong people building community and like taking care of each other. It's more or less positive. Exactly. We got such huge ongoing national media coverage that was sympathetic and that they wrapped it up with the care system stories that it became even more sympathetic that polling shifted radically Within one year of the, of the FDA demo, the Gallup polling changed over 20 points in opposite directions. So the homophobia started to fall rapidly. And when you polled Americans and said, should we be spending more money, tax dollars on AIDS research? It was close to 80%. These changes over a year is crazy. Absolutely crazy. ACT UP did that. And within two years after that, we had gone from very little money being spent on AIDS research to over a billion dollars a year by 1990, just three years after ACT UP was formed. And other disease groups were complaining about how much was be being spent on AIDS. Wow. Of course, we still didn't know whether we would live long enough to see the fruits of our success. Our bottom line was to stop the death and dying. Sure, we got the, the polling in our favor. We got sympathetic press. We got money being spent. We got a government response. But the death rate kept going up. The science wasn't fast enough. 
And it wasn't until 1996 that we had the breakthrough that was massive and the death rates fell by 80%. And just to clarify, that breakthrough is when they created the drug regimen so you could be undetectable. Exactly. Protease inhibitors came out. That got added to the older drugs in what were called the cocktail regimens. Three drugs at once is what did the trick. So tell me if I'm missing something, but I was kind of gobsmacked in your book to read that you became undetectable in 96. Undetectable meaning you cannot transmit the virus to anybody else. I'd only ever heard about being undetectable in the last few years. I think it's like only entered the public consciousness recently. So I was surprised that like you've been undetectable for 20 years and like we didn't know what that meant almost like as a public. And we have a gay run public health messaging campaign to thank for that called U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. The science that clearly definitively spelled out that a person with HIV who has undetectable viral load cannot transmit the virus, that science did not come until recently. Well, let's put it this way, till around 2008, 2009, 2010. We had early data from the get-go that it most likely blocked transmission. But the huge confirmation trials that would convince the rest of the world and convince HIV negative guys that it's safe to sleep with a positive guy, that didn't come until 10 to 15 years ago. That's why you've only... And then the U equals U campaign had to get launched in order to spread that message. And that's why most people haven't heard about it in, until the last decade. I mean, it's just such a game changer. We were talking earlier about how you thought you would never have sex again. And then you learned that, oh, I can wear a condom and have sex. What did it then feel like to learn, oh, like scientifically, I cannot transmit this virus? You know, I've, been, I've, I've felt liberated ever since the condom, frankly. But yeah, this is, <laughs> this is uh, even more so. And the more so for me is not so much my own. You know, I, I didn't suffer from self-stigma in that regard. You know, from 96 on, I have not worried about infecting another person. But I have always worried about the backlash of somebody freaking out after I've had sex with them. And now that is going away. And that is just, it's like, it's in a whole new world. And it's so liberating. I mean, I don't want to have to keep comforting unwarranted fears in other men. And we're, we're all finally learning. HIV stigma has plagued us as long as HIV has, and we're finally making a dent in it, and the world is better for it. With the job that you quit on Wall Street to do, like act up full time, that allowed you to be on TV and to be photographed because you didn't need to worry about being fired for being gay. Right. I had to quit. And so you being on TV as like an out gay man, that was incredibly rare back then. Yeah. What was even rarer were the gay men who were willing to say they had HIV on national television. It was not a huge club of us in the 80s and not a huge club, believe it or not, within ACT UP. I would estimate that 30 to 40 percent of the gay men in ACT UP in the first couple of years were HIV positive. Not all of them knew it because not everybody had been tested, but the stigma was such and people had jobs they had to worry about after I did this crazy year of keeping my job on wall, you know, being a closeted bonds trader by day and a radical AIDS activist by night, my CD4 account crashed and I made the decision to go on disability and, and leave my job. That freed me up totally. And I just went all in on being an out activist. And so when the media committee, that media committee was constantly bombarded by the press for one-on-one -on -one interviews. And the number one thing the press asked for is they said, we want to talk to a person with HIV. We want to talk to one of your members that is living with this. And the media committee only had a dozen, maybe, initially, people who were willing to go on national TV to do that. How aware was your family of the work you were doing? Very aware. I, I came out to them within a, about 10 days of my diagnosis. But like, for example, like when you were in 60 Minutes, like were they like bragging to their friends about like, you've got to watch Peter on TV? <laughs> My mother was. <laughs> My dad was very proud of all of my activism. He was a Republican. 
but I know that he was there for me every minute with total pride and advice. I would talk act up strategy with him. He helped me with act up strategy. It's like, I'm going to go invade Burroughs Welcomes headquarters, dad. What do you think their CEO will think about that? Because <laughs> you're a CEO. <laughs> and he would he, he'd give me his honest advice. And uh, I'm sure there were awkward situations for him. I'm convinced of it. But he never let me hear any of that. And so you eventually left ACT UP, I believe it was like 92 or 93. Right. We split off. Yeah. But your today, you and your story is intimately tied to ACT UP. But, you know, it wasn't like a happy split when you left. Have you always been able to look back on your time and ACT UP fondly? Oh, God, yes. I mean, it was by any measure the, the greatest years of my life. And certainly the last year year and a half was very, very painful with the infighting that started. But the three and a half years before that were, you know, lightning in a bottle. Well, compared to like today, back then, like the activism, the LGBTQ so-called rights movement, it was only about HIV AIDS. Like when did you start to feel it like moving on to other things? It was shocking how quickly that happened after the breakthrough in 96 when the treatments started saving lives on mass. The community pivoted so, you know, like 90% of HRC and NGLTF's agenda all through the 80s up until 96 was AIDS. 90% of their agenda. They were doing very little gay rights. And by, I would say, two years later, it was less than 10%. It, it, they pivoted so fast to gays in the military and then gay marriage that it was... It was like a bitch slap against the face of everybody who had been in ACT UP and who was living with HIV. I mean, we felt abandoned in a sense, and we felt the history was being abandoned. I get why it happened. Very human reasons. I mean, the mental harm that year after year and month after month we had lived through for over a decade, when we got a break from that, when the memorial stopped, there, there was just this human instinct of saying, oh my God, I don't want to think about this for a while. You know, even I felt that. I really, I, did, I, I took a break. I didn't think I wanted to get back into AIDS activism for a while. I took a good long break. So it's a very human reaction. But to see the whole community move like that at once was a little frightening and, and hard to take. So one of the questions I have now with COVID, is that going to, you know, help us find a cure for HIV AIDS faster or is just so much now focused on something else and it's going to push our timeline like even further out? I think it's going to help actually. COVID is definitely teaching both parties how necessary it is to invest in public health and AIDS will get its share of that, those increases. I think we will easily get very large increases in the NIH budget for many years to come. We will certainly get a strengthening of the CDC, which never got much increase, even during the AIDS years. So there'll be big investments in public health. The medical challenge of HIV cure research and HIV vaccine remain enormous. You know, the, the, the political dynamics can't really change that. These are still extraordinarily hard challenges, but the money invested towards them will increase and I'm convinced I will see both of those in my lifetime. You're 60 now. Yep. You're 100% certain it'll happen in your lifetime. Yeah. I think within 10 years. How long have you thought that? That's a big change from like being diagnosed and thinking, okay, well, I've got two years. I've had 20, 30 kind of as a mark in my head for the last decade or more as far as what we call a functional cure which might not necessarily be a sterilizing cure in the sense that we give something, a person with HIV can take something that primes our immune system so that our immune system can control the HIV on its own without the need for daily drugs. That's called a functional cure. Sterilizing cure is getting HIV completely out of the body. We might not get there by 2030, but you know, a functional cure where you take like a vaccine, a HIV vaccine and then I don't have to take anything ever again. I take that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that sounds pretty good. 
I mean, like we've learned now with COVID, like we have a vaccine. We learn how yeah. not easy that is to one get it to like everyone yeah. in the world, but also even the other people in the U.S. And there's a big there's there's a lot of misunderstanding among the queer community today, even among people with HIV, saying, "Well, look how fast they got a vaccine for COVID." It must be some lack of interest or a conspiracy why we don't have an HIV vaccine. And it's not that. I'm here to tell you it's not that. They've been hard at work at vaccines, HIV vaccines for decades. decade. HIV is, if you measured the brain within a virus, and viruses don't have brain, but if you measured the tricks and the, and the, the trickiness of each virus, COVID would be the dumbest virus in the class, and HIV would be the, the genius. HIV is so fucking hard to fix what it does in your body, because what it does is it undermines your immune system. Its sole goal is to undermine your immune system. COVID's sole goal is to kill you quickly by flooding your lungs. But HIV slowly rips apart your immune system, which is what you need to have a vaccine work. <laughs> that is incredibly clarifying because I I was one of those people that said like 600,000 people have like died of COVID and yet 700,000 in the US have died of the uh, HIV complications. AIDS. Yeah, AIDS. Yeah. I think like 35, 36 million worldwide have died of HIV like is our current count. Right, right. And so my thought was like it was honestly like a lack of interest in money. So no. I, I, I appreciate your analogy. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the HIV vaccine issue, we're getting closer. Uh, and we've got some large trials going on. I mean, if we get eventually a candidate that has like 40 to 50% of effectiveness, that would be a game changer. And that would be very, very hard to do because the virus, its whole job is to get around the immune response. It's what it's trained to do. That, that's, that's its sole purpose. COVID doesn't know how to get around the immune system. Wow. I think that ending on a hopeful note like that yeah. is great. Yeah. So thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And that was Peter Staley. His memoir, Never Silent, is out now. And then if you want to hear more about ACT UP, you can listen to our interviews with Sarah Shulman and Ann Northrup. Peter was actually there next to Ann at the infamous Stop the Church action that she described. I thought I was going to die. I'm lying in the center aisle of the cathedral silently, and I'm sure I'm going to be trampled to death by all these people. I happened to be the last person carried out, and by that time, everything had calmed down and was silent, so I started saying, and it was ringing through the cathedral, we're fighting for your lives, too. We're fighting for your lives, too, which I hoped would be effective, but they got us all out of there. They took us off to the police precincts. I like to say I got home to watch the second half of the the Giants-Broncos game. <laughs> so that full interview with Anne is available in our podcast feed, and there's also a link in our show notes. Thank you so much to everyone who's been listening and leaving comments on Apple Podcasts. Subscribing is crucial so you don't miss an episode, yes, but when you also scroll down to our page in Apple Podcasts and leave a comment, it helps other people find our show. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with Glad. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I will see you next week. 